Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is week 15, and uh, I already provided some uh, upper level materials, which for more advanced people who wants to do advanced things, especially maybe they, are, they think in future, they either for their research or industry, they might do extra things. So I still do publishing. Uh, even through the break, we have two months of break. I still I may add some materials during the break. I think for you guys, I also recommend to do that. So I believe this this is actually a very new course, and maybe I think in future it will be divided two sections. Maybe first section is something similar to SQL, which you more focus on data management and Hadoop core, and second part maybe more more <laughs> advanced uh, machine learning approach. But right now in, in the whole nation, it's just one course. Uh, so, but anyway, I, I'm trying to introduce a new course later. So it's the reason I'm going to add some new materials in the YouTube channel and I introduce a website later. So if you're during break, you have time, you can check those ma extra materials. Uh, again, uh, this semester was a strange semester. I mean, COVID time on top of, uh, so we had some, always uh, we hear from university that the students are under pressure. So it's the reason, I mean, you might remember last year, every week we had a quiz and like homeworks and this semester, especially from provost and our college told us don't put too much pressure on the students. So it's the reason the policy was having less load, but I'm glad that your learning is very good. So I know many business programs that they provide such a materials and your learning was in almost, in my point of view, uh, is the best among the schools that I'm aware of. In many schools, they even don't go to coding that much. They mostly focus on the concept and general ideas, but you have very good hands-on experiences. We started from basic concepts in data management, what does Hadoop core means, what is the MapReduce concept, and we then let uh, end up machine learning, which I, again, I believe it should be in two courses, not just one course. And uh, in future, it depends on where you go. It, you might do research or be in the industry. Uh, most likely there's a software engineer or network engineer that provides the platform for you. And you as a business analyst, analyst, you should use the data and provide some business insights and like the homework that I posted. So based on your knowledge in this course and the, one of the speakers don't have to be all of them, just one of them is enough you can provide a business idea that maybe you can develop with your knowledge in this course. Uh, just as an example, for example, my last paper that I just published, I used uh, a cluster in, a, I didn't use AWS or uh, Google Cloud. I use uh, a state of Ohio supercomputer. So the still big, very big data so is still a supercomputer, but none of them. So for my case, it was uh, uh, at least one or maybe some uh, network engineers that provide the platform for me. So I could easily upload my data in the cloud and use something similar to Databricks, very similar actually. And I was able to do that. So most likely in the future, you. Uh, you would do that. So, and the good thing, your uh, as you might work with the Databricks, uh, PySpark is a still in the development phase, and maybe you cannot do so many other uh, functions that are available through Python. It's a good thing, actually. One of the reason I got this job, there's just not there's not that much of people who knows how to teach the course. So, and I assume when you end up in the industry, so it's not, there shouldn't be too much of people who can do coding in the Spark environment, or at least have some uh, hands-on experiences in the platform, which there's a good advantage from you guys. We can start run a big project. It depends where you go. I mean, uh, your company might work with the Google Cloud or like AWS or like my last project, it might be even a state supercomputer, but at the end, uh, there is some people that help you how to manage the data, take care of the uh, background of the cl cluster, but you are the guy who should get a business or research insight from your data. Uh, again, I'm really glad that we covered so many, so many materials and it's, uh, I've talked with other colleagues in other schools and they're impressed because 
they didn't expect that you, you could be covered too much of matter, especially during COVID time. Again, so it might be some uh, problem from my side and also some platform problem we had, had. for example, Cloudera suddenly stops uh, servicing. So it was actually real, it, the most difficult course that I've taught so far because suddenly before the semester, I had to change everything. Uh, not everything, at least like 40, 50% of the materials. And uh, also Apache, Apache had some uh, bugs, especially for the Windows users. Uh, it's the reason sometimes uh, I had to change some topics because even for me, get, uh, dealing with those bugs is very difficult. I assume the students who want to just learn uh, the bug might cause some problems. So I, sometimes I avoid some platforms. Uh, the reason again, Apache Spark and Hadoop, Hive, uh, Cloud, I mean, those cloud company are very new thing. And uh, for example, last thing I saw that they uh, um, help and resolve one of the bugs, but it is very challenging, and, but they, it's, a, it's difficult con uh, content to learn. But the good thing, you're among the, the uh, almost the first generation that learned such a thing. So you have an advantage of knowing something ahead of time, being the uh, having the cutting edge knowledge. Anyway, thank you very much. We, I was I was glad to be your instructor from last year so far, and I have to look at the uh, performance of you guys. So we are competing the national challenges and really good ranking, and also some we had really good jobs. And I expect have you be very successful in the near future. Uh, I'm telling you, who knows? I mean, uh, the current CEO of uh, even uh, let's just uh, give you an example. Who know, the one who I know, CEO of Apple, used to be in my previous school, and he he did the same program that I did. Maybe I was not as smart as him. He's a CEO of Apple right now. I got the same program. Now I'm just a professor, but. Uh, uh, if just be very hardworking, be very smart, uh, take advantages of opportunities that you have. Who knows? Maybe uh, Yushi or Shoshang would be, I mean, the founder of a, a multi-billion company in near future. Who knows? And the rest of you, like Punavit, Hisuen, and other names. There's so many names. I, sorry, I cannot say all the names. Anyway, thank you very much. So let's uh, start from the line uh, again today at uh, there's two groups, GBN and Yushu from two different groups talked with me too. They want to present. They present uh, by, uh, one by one. And for today materials, I, as you see in Moodle, I already uploaded the materials, but I'm going to make a video and post it asynchronously. And again, during break, um, I will introduce it like a website. So, and I keep posting the materials because in near future, I assume it would be divided in two courses, but if you're interested during break, you can just check those materials that I'm going to post. Anyway, thank you very much. Let me just uh, let you guys share. So GBN, your group can start. Please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> So um, uh, can, I, can I get started? Yeah, please. Um, so good morning, everyone. Good morning, Professor. And uh, this is Jie Bian and Zizhan Xiao. And today our project is about the credit card fraud detection. So credit card have become an indispensable item in our daily life. And they help us purchase services and goods and only require signatures or passwords. Um, Okay. Um, the security of a credit card depends on the card's physical security and the confidentiality of the credit card number. Well, with the development of globalization and the advent of the internet era, online shopping makes people using credit card more and more often. And it also contributes to a surge in credit card fraud. Um, there are many studies that are using traditional manual detection methods to detect fraudulent transactions, but it is time consuming and inefficient. So the emergence of big data makes manual methods impractical. 
Um, and as a result, in fin financial institutions have focused on the latest calculation methods to deal with the credit card fraud. Um, this project will analyze the relationship between 28 independent variables and target variable and visualize them and build math and build models to predict the credit card fraud. Oh. Um, this data set contains transactions made by credit card in September 2013 by European card holders. This data set present uh, transactions that occurs in two days where we have 492 frauds out of more than 284,000 transactions. The data, site, the data set is highly unbalanced. The positive cluster accounts only for 0.172% of all transactions. Um, it, it contains only numerical input variables, which are the results of a PCA transformation. Unfortunately, we couldn't know the original features and more background information due to the confidentiality issues. So the only feature that have not been transformed are time and amount. Feature time contains the seconds elapsed between each transaction and the first transaction in the data set. And feature amount is the transaction amount. Feature class is the target variable and it takes the value one in case of fraud and zero, and zero otherwise. So then we performed the feature engineering. By checking this data set, we did not find any missing values. And in order to get better model performance, we carried out outlier detection on the data. Uh, we applied box plot to all the variables here we use the feature V10 as an example. Uh, just let me give you a comment. So here is totally yeah. fine, but in your report, I mean, the final report include, uh, don't leave uh, figures alone, put explanation for all the figures and tables that you have. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, it's just, um, maybe you did, right? it's just my comment. Okay, oh, we'll, we'll add it. Okay, that's great. Um, we can see here that there are many outliers for the feature. However, we can see there that um, since the positive close only accounted for 0.172% of the entire data set, such as such a small amount of fraud data is very likely to be classified as an outlier for normal transactions. Therefore, we separate the data with plus one and zero to detect outliers, which, is, which also confirm our guess. Um, the positive class mostly fall in the area of outliers. We deleted data with class of zero that was less than the first quartile and data greater than the third quartile and outliers. In other words, you only keep the middle 50% of the data. Oh. Um, here by checking the data description, it's significantly different from removing the out layers. And then we use standard scalar function to normalize amount to make the precise data confirm to the standard normal distribution. That is the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So the normalization help us improve the accuracy of the model. Some classifiers need to calculate the distance between samples um, such as the Euclidean distance, um, the, volume, um, the value range of amount is vast, but the actual situation may be that the feature with a small value range is more important. So the distance calculation may mainly depends on amount, which may contrary to the actual situation. And because of the imbalance of two classes distribution in their target variable, we need to treat the imbalance we consider two methods, oversampling and undersampling. But because the number of the positive class is too small, if we choose oversampling, we need to randomly expand the original data volume by nearly 300 times or create nearly 150,000 of new data. This won't significantly affect the accuracy of the model. 
So uh, we choose to use the Ander sampling method to balance the data set. That is randomly select data from the um, negative class and form a new data set with all the po positive class data. So we can make, make their amount roughly equal. And that is the visualization part. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, actually, uh, we tried variable or various graphs, but none of them makes much sense because our features do by PCA. In, uh, in fact, the box plot in the outlier part already shows the distribution of each features. So we then check the relationship between each features. Uh, from the two graphs on the left, which is shows that there is a risk of uh, multicollinearity between the features as some of the variables are correlated above uh, 0.9, such as V12 and V60, uh, which is consistent with that uh, we find in the figure in the left. So we delete V, uh, we delete V16, V17, as well as V3 and V7. And yeah, uh, and we tried four models with cross validation and uh, grid search. This is the summary of the model. And uh, after comparing these models, it is clear that logistic regression has the highest ROC and uh, PR. However, the models all fit well, and the occurrence of each model doesn't differ significantly. Okay, may I pause you a little bit? So in your final report, mm -hmm. show us the, uh, I mean, the ROC and accuracy of the fold and the test, I mean, the folds. You did cross-validation. If you had a holdout set, also show us the performance of the holdout set. But if you didn't, that's fine. So we just want to see if there is an overfitting or the stable results. What I mean, let's say you have five-fold cross-validation. Let's mm -hmm. say, what is the performance on each fold? If you use a specific, uh, you know, I know PyStruck isn't as flexible as Python. So maybe for some algorithms, you cannot show the result of each fold. That's fine. But try to, uh, because you had uh, cross-validation, uh, you probably can, uh, at least, well, I, I know for some of them, is, uh, I'm pretty sure it's available. Uh, otherwise, um, I mean, I was thinking if you do it just in one train, one set, but your data set is very really small. So, because you did under sampling, so you can, I mean, five-fold cross validation is a good approach now. Usually, uh, when you have a very large data set, doing cross validation is not very recommended, but it's not the case for you, because for you, you, uh, you already had a chopped a, a big portion of your data. But anyway, go ahead, please. But you got the point. We want to see if there is overfitting or uh, too much of variances in each fold. Okay. Uh, yeah. Next, please. Oh, yeah. And uh, since the uh, logistic regression is our best model, but it had it doesn't have the uh, feature importance attributes, so we choose the second one, which is random forest. And we can see that uh, there are the top five uh, score, uh, important features for our target features. Yeah, and uh, 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 the four model we have used have all yield from promising results, but this doesn't mean that they are perfect. This result tell us that fraud cases are pronounced and uh, that we can identify them through data, data. For example, in data visualization, we found that most of fraud cases were outliers, 
after we felt uh, filtered out the out layer, we were left with only 15 fraud cases, which means we can find most of the fraud cases by looking at the data. Okay, uh, just one thing. I want to, I, I, I want you guys add extra result because you are doing fraud detection. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can do uh, sensitivity and specificity, because you have two classes, uh, let's say class of, class of fraud, class of, I mean, um, healthy transaction, I want to see how's your performance for each class. Maybe uh, you have a very good performance for fraud detection, mm -hmm. or when there is not fraud, you have a bad performance, or maybe you have a bad performance for fraud, but you have a very good uh, performance for finding healthy transaction. So you can Google this sensitivity specifically, I'm pretty sure it's available. Uh, otherwise, maybe you can manually f see what is your accuracy for each classes. Anyway, go ahead. Um, that's all. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Really good project. Just add to uh, the thing that I mentioned. If there's a figure and tables, um, just uh, where's my camera? Okay. So if there's a, any table or figure, just Put a good explanation. What the what you what is your insight from them? For your project, you already had business insights. Also, I want to see if there is a if there is a evidence of overfitting or not. If at the end you have overfitting, that's fine. At least you try to avoid that. And uh, what else? Okay. So for you, a fraud detection is important, and uh, he uh, predicting health healthy transactions might be important too. So show that your performance of your model into uh, classes of the dependent value. I have one question. Sure. Uh, so uh, like you have used in the random forest classifier, you got a very good uh, like uh, accuracy, but like how did you achieve that number? Because like with that kind of a uh, uh, like, uh, with that kind of a very less frauds compared to the data set, like it's very difficult to achieve that particular accuracy. And if it's not achieving, and if you're not able to achieve that, uh, and if you're able to achieve them, then there is some kind of a problem with it. So like, did you encounter any kind of a, any kind of an instance when you were able to identify that, yeah, this is wrong in this data set, or this is wrong in this accuracy, because this is not something I think According to my understanding, it's not possible to achieve this accuracy with this unbalanced data set. Uh, Shashank, do you know what they did? They they make the data set balance. Yeah, I understand that, but like Professor, still, uh, like uh, how much? Like then it's then I feel that that it's very it, it will be very difficult, you know, to keep the uh, to to. If if not anything, then they should uh, then they they should actually avoid the extra data set. Then it doesn't make sense, right? Even if they un, uh, remove the data, uh, if, even if they remove the data. Uh, I mean, there's two things. Uh, one, um, first of all, maybe uh, you might think of uh, they they balance the data set, so they changed um, the nature of their data. That might be okay because they're just randomly picked from the other class, but also they can do boost strapping. Uh, one else, maybe uh, in that case, um, for the fraud class, the variables are very helpful. Maybe there is a very, uh, I mean, very good indicators that the model can easily understand this is uh, could be a fraud. Okay. But I got your point. I, you said th this is a really rare event, how they can like near 90% performance. It's actually one was one model was setting 99%. So like that's triggered me, you know, to like- Could uh, you back, go back to your results again? Yeah. Um... I mean, at the end I run your notebook. If there's any issue, I can see that, but go back to that slide that Shashang is talking about. Yeah. This one? Yeah, okay. yeah. Based on your li literature okay. review, I mean, what what other people did? Do you remember their performance? Um, no, I I just got some like oh, 
yeah, I just got some literature review that um, other people using, um, using like using what method, what model to do this, to do this, um, like to do this uh, fraud, fraud detection. But I, I didn't see the so accuracy. Did, did you get it from Kaggle? Yeah. I think sometimes in Kaggle, some people uh, share their notebooks and show their performance. So, do you do you do you know the link now that we could check? Oh uh, yeah, I think we can check it. Kaggle fraud detection. But no worries. I mean, you're submitted ahead of time, so you have a very good time if you can if you want to change. Is it credit card fraud detection? I think found it. So let's see what other people did. Um, Oops. Okay, somebody did come with national neural network. I want to see their performance. In the meantime, may I add something? Uh, Shashank, some other people also had very good accuracy. I'm checking the other people not work. Okay. So it seems, yeah. Maybe they, I mean, their variable is very kind of too much helpful because I see somebody has a near 99% performance in there. Yeah. And it could be literature. Okay, cool. Okay, I mean, no worries. I mean, uh, if you don't have any issue and you have good performance, why not? But there's no wrong, uh, nothing wrong with that. I just want to see how you're good in uh, predicting different classes and uh, just show me that there is no evidence of overfitting. That should be fine. Okay. Okay, I think Punavit has a question. It's just like uh, I got the same problem because my data is a uh, is unbalanced as well, and I I resample it, and when I test the data, my accuracy is very like uh, uh, eighty percent or ninety percent. The reason is that because when I use the, the test data, the test data, how can I say uh, it's like uh, I resum I resampling the data and I split data and then I split data train and trace sets. And then I use the test data, which is resampling, which is it's not, it's not, it's not a real data, it's not actual data. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you, actually you are, uh, the, uh, the actual data is unbalanced. If you test the data is on balanced data, it's, uh, the, the accuracy is, it should, should be high. Yeah, I, I think uh, Punamit uh, gives a uh, good insight. Do you know what he said? He's basically saying that you can do anything with your train set. So you can do oversampling, other sampling, anything. But at then you have a holdout set or a test set that shows the actual uh, distribution of the data. So for those reasons, he, uh, I think he's right. So basically maybe in your, when you do cross validation, uh, since you balance your data, your performance near 99%, that's achievable. But uh, he believes that you should have a holdout set or test separate test set and see what's the performance of your model on that set. Very good point from Punavit. So uh, my, suggestion, my suggestion is like uh, you, uh, you split data to train and test set, and then you just resample only train set. Yeah, uh, uh, GBN and uh, the other, uh, forgot yeah, the name. I, uh, I think and I G Zijan. So Zijan and GBN. So what you can do, uh, let's say pick a percentage of, um, what, let's say I'm just through a number, 20% of class one and 20% of class zero as your holdout set, put it, yeah, uh, actually we, we do, actually we, we, we are do like that. 
we split the data and transact after we end their ballot and their sampling. I mean, we no, 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 after no. We, For test set, you shouldn't uh, touch the distribution of the data. So your test set should show the actual proportion of class one and class zero. But for your training set, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so we use the original data to display the training set. Yes. But it could be just only have the not no fraud class. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, let's say uh, due to in, in two steps. First, in the first step. Uh, oh, like, I understand. You, you mean we separate the data in class zero and class one and choose 20% of each one. Or any percent, the 10%, 20, 30. I mean, I mean, there is no biblical rule for that. So oh. just, okay, you're, divide your actual data in two sections. Uh, once, uh, usually we call it holdout set, but in some paper they call it test set. So you have an independent holdout or test set that you put aside and it shows the actual proportion of class zero and class one. The remaining 80% you can use for training your algorithm, doing cross-validation or whatever thing that you want to do. And then after you train a good model, use your holdout set to, to show us your performance. Maybe at the end it will be 99%, who knows? But it's, uh, I mean, the, the approach that Punovic said is uh, the best approach. Yeah, okay, I'll, we'll try this method. Okay. Good job. I mean, you present sooner. No worries. I mean, you have enough time to just. You have. I, th I think you have five days to play with your uh, project. So, but good project. Thank you. Very applicable. Thank you. And thank you for putting it. Very good comment. Okay. The next group. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. You can uh, start sharing your screen and uh, present the that is more comfortable for you. Okay. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. For today's presentation, we are going to talk about uh, the big data for the NFL games. Uh, there are two objectives uh, we want to talk about. Uh, the first one is uh, how to what will affect the defensive performance for each team, and the second is the what is the well, which one is the best player make for the successful defensive. So the first thing I want to talk about the next gen statistic technology. So basically, they were they can basically they can capture all the real time uh, data. Uh, in the game. Uh, here is the uh, brief illustration about this technology. So we can see that the, these circles are present for the players. And here is the ball. And uh, in this technology company, they installed, I mean, chips on the players' uh, clothes on their shoulders and uh, the chips on the ball. So uh, uh, by this mm, system, uh, we can, uh, the, the NFL can get the, the players um, speed uh, and how many yards they have run and their direction. So basically we use this data, we can represent, reproduce the, the thing on the playground. And uh, besides this fancy data set, we also have the traditional data set, like the game data and the play data and the, the players data. So what we, we, we the, this data set is huge, it's like two GB. And uh, so we, we, we were thinking about what we can do for using this big data set. The, mm, so as I mentioned, uh, we saw that maybe we can measure the defensive performance for each team. So we go deep into the tracking data set and we capture the, the balls tracking data and we just pick 
uh, three teams randomly. So we got the this Philadelphia Eagles and the Colts and the Steelers. We can see that that this uh, dark purple area. This is means the the offensive team they pass their balls mostly. So they also represent that in this uh, purple area, the defense team have the like relatively vulnerable defense. Uh, so we saw that maybe we capture, we, we show all the uh, teams a uh, vulnerable part uh, on the playground The we can um, give the coach or the team some insights so they can uh, make, um, they can, how to say, they can uh, do their best to, to, um, to, <laughs> enhance their their defense on this area and uh, uh, the second objective not not the second the plus the first plus uh, zero five objective is that we go deep through the the players data set and uh, to our surprise we find that uh, the the second most uh, position is the cornerback the the cornerback uh, so here are the two positions that the cornerback that covers. Uh, for the first one, uh, they, they need to cover the wide receivers or they need to cover the, the, the zones on the playground. So we were thinking that um, maybe we can use this tracking data set to predict, to find what they cover on the playground. And uh, we can label those uh, labels, we can label their coverage for the teams and uh, give some reset insights for the coaches. So uh, let me let each and talk about the this uh, second objectives. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, can can you guys see my screen? Uh, this uh, is skin showing second objective. Uh, yes. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Yi Shen and today I'm going to talk about our second objective. So we tried to use the tracking data to provide the labels of the pass coverage type for our cornerbacks. But um, before we dive deep into how we provide the labels, uh, we would like to have some brief introductions about what is cornerback and what is the pass coverage. So um, the cornerback is one of the most important defensive positions and their main responsibility is to defend against the offensive pass and they require high speed and agility because they are often matched up with the wide receiver one on one. So which means that there is no help by other teammates in the coverage. So if a cornerback doesn't defend wide receiver well, it can lead a huge gains for the offensive team or even the touchdown. So in conclusions, having a great cornerback is really important for the defensive team because that could change the game completely. And what is main and zone coverage? In main coverage, uh, cornerbacks is assigned to defend a specific offensive player. Typically, it's a wide receiver. And throughout the play, the cornerbacks will follow his targeting players to prevent him from catching the ball. And on the country, in zone coverage, a cornerback is um, responsible for a specific zone instead of a specific players. And after introduce, introducing the cornerback and the type of their defensive coverage, I'm gonna talk about our second objective in more detail. So in this project, well, we try to use a supervised model to assign the labels of the coverage type of each cornerbacks. So to accomplish this goal, we take five steps to achieve it. Uh, the first step is the data understanding and data preparations. And uh, also we uh, generate some feature, we do some feature engineering, and then we input our features into the clustering model. Uh, Yi, listen, I, I have a yes. question. 
Yes. Uh, could you give us an uh, advantage of this project? For example, what uh, what is the uh, incentive for this project? Is it for helpful for the coaches or? Uh, yes. Okay. It's Just like, uh, I mean, if you because you know, football is not a big sport in the northeast. I mean, in the south of United States, it's a really big game. Everybody knows about football. But here is a different, I mean, there is, I think baseball is a, uh, is a bigger game, much bigger game. So just explain what is the, why you want to do this project. Uh, I mean, if you predict the labels, what, uh, what advantages you want, what, uh, how you want to use the information. Sorry. Uh, okay. So the reason why we want to provide the label is because um, we believe these uh, labels could pave the way for the further research related to the pass coverage. So it could help the NFL team, defensive team to use this type of label to um, evaluate the defense performance, um, which type of the pass coverage is more, um, is better for the defensive performance. And also, I think we think this could save the time for the coaches because um, usually in this time of label, they always the coach have to uh, collect the information by themselves because the data doesn't provide the, this label automatically. And yeah, and that is our ad advantage. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm going to go for detail about data understanding. So for the data, we use the NFL week one tracking data during the 2018 regular seasons. The data sets contains about 900, 980,000 rows with 19 columns, which is really large. And we can see that this tracking data includes a lot of information of each players, such as their location, the, uh, represent X and Y or their precisions, the speed and the acceleration, etc. And one important thing in this year's tracking data is that this year the NFL provide a new variable, which is the player's orientations. Uh, and this variable did not provide in the previous data. And we believe this new variable would be very helpful and informative for our clustering model to identify the past coverage type. In, and this is the reason because we think that the cornerbacks in main coverage frequently imitate the movement of its targeting player, which means that the orientation of their cornerbacks are facing will closely matching to the direct orientation of its targeting player. And on the other hand, for the cornerbacks in the zone coverage, the orientation is less likely to be affected by the specific player and they would be more likely to face on the life of a scrimmage. Um, so here is our data preparation step two. Um, we first check the vision value to make sure that our data is ready for our classroom model. And we found out that um, the vision value is, most of the missing value is from the football, which will we will not be used in our classing model. So we just eliminated, eliminated eliminated directly. And for the third step is the feature engineering. And this part is especially important because we need to generate a feature that can help the clustering model to successfully identify the main coverage or the zone coverage. So to um, create the right features, we read a lot of paper related to football and soccer, and we refer to their method. So we divided the feature engineering into two steps. The first step is that we regroup the event variable, which could, uh, this variable includes a lot of information such as uh, whenever the ball is thrown, when the, whenever the ball is uh, snapped. So um, the movement of the defense- uh, Yi um, you know, uh, for you that note, uh, about the football, these terms are really easy to understand. What I recommend for your project, 
uh, at the beginning of your project, explain what those like what does staff means, what does pass means, and just provide some general information about the football. So somebody never saw any football game, they can easily understand about the variables. But good project. Please uh, keep going. Uh, so the step is that the. Uh, I mean, you don't need, you the... don't have to explain here. I I was in open Alabama. I know. Uh, uh, I mean football very well. I just say for your project, just include them. Okay. Uh, so for the first step, we regroup the event variable um, because we think the movement of the defensive player could change a lot based on different time periods. For example, if the cornerbacks change his orientations when the ball is thrown, he is more likely to perform man-to-man -man coverage because he's started to or targeting his targeting player. Uh, but on the country, if the cornerback is still facing the line of scrimmage, when the ball is thrown, it is more likely to be playing the zone coverage because uh, he have to take care of a lot of regions, so he, he won't change his orientation a lot. And after we regroup in the event variable, we then generate uh, new features for the each three time periods. For example, you can see that we calculate the variations of the player's movement, their directions, and their orientations. And finally, we use these 11 features to help our clustering model to uh, identify whether it's main coverage or zone coverage. So here is our step four. Uh, we use last year model, mixture model with these 11 features and the reason why we use Gaussian mixture model is that it provides the probability for the, each cluster. So it can tell us how certain we are when assigning main coverage or the zone coverage label for each cornerbacks. And after that, we use cellular score to help us know uh, the cluster quality and find the optimal number of the cluster. So here is our result we found out that the cluster equals two gets the highest cellular score. So this indicates that two cluster solution is the best fit for our data, which matches our intuitions that there are primarily two types of cluster label, main or zone coverage. And we also try other clustering models such as case means or bisecting k means However, they did not perform as good as the Gaussian uh, model. GBN, also, uh, let's say you end up saying two clusters. So use descriptive statistics to explain what makes these two clusters different from each other. Maybe I'm not sure if, uh, let's say, some variables about the speed or other variables. Just uh, look at these two clusters, see what makes these two clusters different from each other. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Very good. Okay. Uh, and here is our final result. So we visualize the positions of the each player, and then we point out what kinds of coverage type based on our classic model manually. So this figure shows how the cornerbacks react before the ball is passed. So in this part, the number 21 and number 31 on our is our cornerbacks, and you can see that before the ball is passed, number 21 and 31 are both identified as co zone coverage. So this is because our model did not find that they are targeting a specific player based on their locations, their directions, and orientations. However, um, like this, another figure, this is a figure that after the ball is passed, and in this part, we can clearly see that number 31 has still been assigned as zone coverage, but the, um, the number 21 is being assigned as the main coverage because our model has identified is starting to target the number 81. So uh, here is our conclusions. Um, in this project, we provide two contributions. First, we visualize the ball pass, ball passing path to help the defensive team evaluate their performance. 
letting them know where is the most and the least vulnerable area so they can identify which area should put more attention on and then improve their defensive performance and strategy. And second contribution is that we provide the unsupervised approach to provide the label about the coverage type for the cornerback. And just like what I said previously, we believe this labeling method could pave the way for our future research related to past coverage. It gives anyone who are interested in the past coverage a good start. But there are still are some limitations. Uh, for instance, the feature that we generate design is only for cornerbacks. So if we want to provide the labels for other positions, we need to consider other factors and generate new features specifically for the specific roles. And also, I think we still have to improve some of the features because due to our serious score, the score is not really high. So I think we still have some improvement. And lastly, it would be better if we can provide the coverage type automatically uh, because it could help the coach to see what's the coverage type right during the game. So they could evaluate the performance just in the process of the game. Okay, could you go back, go back, go back to cluster result? Yes. So, okay, here, stop here. So here, what does each cluster mean? So for example, uh, uh, do you have any interpretation for each cluster? Uh, no, we just wanted to see if the cluster two is the best, is the best fit for our okay. data. Yeah, we just want to prove that the our features could uh, success successfully to label the two cluster. Okay, so I mean, when you explain what makes these two uh, cluster different from each other using the variables, maybe you can provide some in insights uh, what each cluster could refer to. Also, go to the go to to the results. This one? Okay, visual basing pass, provide, okay, second goal, provide label about coverage type of the uh, cornerbacks. Um, how it's related to the two clusters that you explained here? Uh, because because uh, initially we're not sure if the cluster can successfully predict these two types of uh, coverage. So we, we um, visualize a lot of the positions of the player and we assign the probability and the clustering label manually to make sure that we have uh, uh, our model is good for our to provide the label. Okay, uh, I need to read your uh, report to see how you connect these two to each other. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I need to see uh, how your story, I mean, storytelling and uh, how you uh, basically provide the results in, in the way that how you uh, get this conclusion from your unsupervised learning. But anyway, it's a really good project. I know we talk about the data set. It was really a big, I mean, it's a difficult data to work with. And thank you very much. Good project. Thank you. But again, at the end, it provide a very good connection from the res cluster result and the conclusion that you provided here. Okay. Okay. Good. And oh, one more thing, we also we also uh, share a link in the last picture of the GitHub link. Yeah, we uploaded the whole project on the GitHub. So if anyone was interesting, you can. You can check this link. This one. Okay, very good. So is that, I think we almost ran out of time. So, and there is no time for teaching. So anyway, I'm going to either tonight or tomorrow morning, I'm, I will upload some new teaching material. And as I said, I keep uploading during the break. 
we have like two, almost two or three months of the break. I'm not sure if you're staying booster or not. It could be a very good time for you to uh, do something that you missed. Uh, having said that, if you are targeting a PhD program, maybe you can work on the methodology or trying to do some uh, paper. Uh, one of the ways that you can, uh, let me stop recording. You just keep going. Okay. So we have two or three months and it's COVID time uh, is a very good time to focus to improve your skills, uh, either research or industry skills. And it's not recommended to go that much outside, please take care of your health, just in case if you need any help or anything uh, that I can contribute, please let me know. For the people, there is so many of you sent me recommendation letters for PhD and industry jobs. Um, I'm going to start um, submitting from Friday. I've received so many emails for recommendation letters. Uh, most likely in the industry, they would call call me later. They, usually they are, I mean, written, they look at the written recommendation, but usually they call the advisors. So if you think they would be a call, give me their phone number or let me know when they might call so I don't miss their call. If you need written recommendation, which mostly for PhD applicants, uh, if I missed your email and I haven't submitted, there is no worries, just send me a reminder because I received so many emails. I mean, if it's possible that I miss uh, some of them, which I don't want. So in case if I miss anything, I mean, you can reach me through email or group me or any ways that is more convenient for you and just send me a reminder. So hopefully I don't miss any recommendation, either industry or PhD. Any, anyway, it was a really great semester. I, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, among the graduate programs, your knowledge and skills is uh, one of the best in the country. You uh, definitely can uh, join a company or a research institute and start working. Maybe based on the domain, as I said, for my research, I have to work with the big data platform of the state of Ohio. It's kind of different from Hadoop, AWS, or whatever, uh, Google Cloud. So no worries. I mean, you still can focus on the data management part, which since I don't think it's very necessary, I'm going, I'm, I put the last topics that I may cover. And also, as I said, during break, I would uh, still post some materials. And, but anyway, please take care of your health. It, I was, it was my very pleasure to have you as my students during the last uh, few semesters from last year to now. And I hope to see you very successful uh, either in this course and also in the future. Thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. Uh, oh, professor, uh, I have okay. a question. Sure. Uh, it's Hopper on the mic. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, said, yeah. Uh, you said we can get bonus if we can run the code in Google Cloud. Uh, Google Cloud, AWS, or your own PC, any extra yeah. platform. Yeah, so far I can run in the Google API notebook. Is that okay? I mean, it should be PySpark, not Python. Uh, but the notebook can only choose uh, Python 2 or Python 3. There's no uh, option of Py PySpark. For the you, uh, no, you can. You can uh, uh, do PySpark yes. in Google. Um, okay. I mean, uh, we'll just see out. how to set up PySpark uh, or Spark in Google. There is good, uh, I've seen some good tutorials. It's not very difficult. First, you should run a, uh, you should uh, uh, set up a bucket. Bucket means a place that you upload your file. Then uh, you should run a cluster or a Google Cloud and okay. just uh, make a connection between your bucket and okay. the okay. Spark Notebook. I mean, it might take at most half a day for you to learn. I mean, in, in a couple of hours, you can learn, but at most half a day. Half a day. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Anyway, any pla extra platform that you do, you should do PySpark, not Python. Cool, any other mm -hmm. questions? No. I might, I saw a question maybe over text. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, again, uh, uh, next. Um, I, anyway, I have uh, got good comments from your friends that they were happy that we had guest speakers. If I uh, still receive uh, by tomorrow, if I see good comments or uh, emails from you asking the new speakers, I may find uh, one speaker from uh, European company. Uh, and also a um, lady who used to work, I think, in Pfizer, and now she's, should, she's somewhere else. So if I still receive those comments, uh, Monday, I'm, if, we don't have any class on Monday, but I recommend to join because, I mean, uh, at the end, you might uh, end up, many of you want to be in the industry side, so you can see how they work with the data in the industry. And for example, if somebody is in the transportation industry or somebody is the finance industry, which kind of skills you should improve. And I mean, you can use this couple of months uh, to improve those skills for the job market. So anyway, I, I, I sit and wait for your comments. And if I see enough comments, uh, I set up a guest speaker session on the Monday. And otherwise, I in the year class time, I, I, I just join, even if there's no one, I keep making some uh, videos for the class. I, still, I mean, there's no teaching for tomorrow, tomorrow. I mean, sorry, next week is a break. I know that, but uh, as I said, I believe this course should be divided in two sections. I'm going to keep uh, posting some materials that we, I couldn't cover, which I mean, is again, most of them are out of content or in the upper levels, which is not necessary for many of you, maybe for many of you is, maybe for some reason. But anyway, you can use the, those uh, materials. Anyway, have a good rest of the day. Good to see you guys. Bye.